Hello everyone and thank you for coming to this talk and thank you to the organisers for arranging this conference in, uh, in difficult situations. So I'm going to talk about some work I've done with Luca Zanetti on the fastest mixing Markov chain problem. Okay, so what what is this question? Uh, we have, we're given a graph G and our goal is to sample uniformly from its vertex set V. And we, we are allowed to do this via a Markov chain uh, but the Markov chain is only allowed to make transitions across edges in the edge set of the graph in E. Uh, we're trying to sample uniformly from V, so we choose a Markov chain with uniform invariant distribution, and naturally we want the mixing time to be as fast as possible. Uh, so formally, this is a minimization program. We want to minimize the mixing time, which, which has this precise definition in terms of the first time the total variation distance between the law of the chain and uniform is smaller than a quarter. We want to minimize this over all transition matrices, which are stochastic, have uniform invariant distribution, and have this uh, local property that you know, exists on, on, on the graph. Here, u is the uniform distribution, and the total variation distance, it uh, sort of quantifies how easily it is, how easy it is to distinguish two measures. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of simplifications. First is to only consider reversible Markov chains. Uh, and in particular, we're considering the uniform invariant distribution, but we're requiring a uniform invariant distribution. So this imposes that our transition matrix are tra our trans transition matrices are symmetric. Okay, reversible, uh, reversible Markov chains are characterized by random walks on weighted graphs. That is, given any reversible Markov chain, you could always define a graph uh, and a weighting on, on that graph so that, such that the reversible Markov chain is given by the random walk on this weighted graph, and the converse also holds. So in essence, we're looking for an optimal weighting of a graph. We're also only interested in uh, bounds on this fastest mixing Markov chain problem up to uh, constant factors. And so uh, we're happy to impose laziness. Um, and this, has, this is helpful because then all our, our spectrum is, uh, is non-negative. Okay, the, the mixing time, though, is a rather delicate object. It depends on you know, the norm which we've chosen as total variation, but also depends on the starting location and, uh, and the precision parameter epsilon. Uh, instead of looking at the mixing time, we're going to look at the relaxation time and use this as a as a proxy for the for for the mixing time. It's well known that uh, the relaxation time and the mixing time differ by at most a logarithmic factor. Um, th this same proxy has been used in the majority of previous work on the fastest mixing Markov chain problem. In, 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 in particular, this uh, fast mixing Markov chain problem was introduced by Boyd, Darkness, and Zhao uh, in a series of paper, also with Perlo and, and Sun in some other papers. And uh, they, they looked at not necessarily mixing, but the, but the uh, optimal spectral gap or optimal re uh, re uh, relaxation time. So these dates, you might wonder why they're not in order. The dates are the publication dates, not, not necessarily comes corresponding to the uh, order in which they were written. Okay, but so basically Boyd, Diakis, and Zhao introduced it in their first paper, the fastest mixing Markov chain on a, on a graph. And they studied things like uh, showing that the fastest mixing Markov chain problem is an STP, and so, so you, know, you can solve it reasonably quickly with standard uh, STP solvers. And they also looked a bit at the dual. But then Rock looked at the dual and did a lot more work with the dual and you know, did some stuff with variational characterizations, which we'll come to later. And then uh, Phil and Khan did some work on it a bit more recently, and a bit more recently, Akar and Chan did as, uh, as well. OK, our results. We have two main results, uh, and they're for discrete time chains. Uh, we also have some additional results, an additional result for continuous time chains, as well as one for time inhomogeneous chains, but, but I won't mention the latter two here. I'll just focus on the main two. Okay, so the first one, 
is basically that vertex conductance characterizes fast mixing. So let's let um, let's let C denote the vertex conductance of a of a graph, and then the fastest reversible mixing time uh, satisfies this Chiga type inequality. So um, I've got the mixing time on on the right, but this is a consequence of the of the relaxation time. So this is like Chiga, but we have this extra log n factor. Okay, the second theorem is an existence of a fast, well, what we call almost mixing chain. So given a fixed epsilon uh, positive, then there always exists a reversible transition matrix P satisfying uh, relaxation time being at most diameter squared and having invariant distribution that is epsilon close to to uniform. So every vert so even stronger than epsilon close to total variation, every vertex is you know, at most a factor one minus epsilon smaller than you know, than the corresponding uniform. Okay, so now I'll 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 just do a couple of examples and then we'll talk briefly about how to prove these two statements. So I'll just let phi and c denote the edge and vertex conductances respectively. And just a reminder that Chiga's inequality says that the relaxation time for the simple random walk is characterized by the, uh, by the edge conductance in, in this particular form. OK, so first example is to have two cliques of size n and then connect these, or maybe n over two, um, and then connect these by a perfect matching. Now the simple random walk on this graph has mixing time that's order n. Uh, indeed, for order n steps, it will stay in whichever clique it starts, because each time there are n minus one vert uh, edges that lead to other vertices in the clique, and one that leads to the other clique. So it's going to take order n to swap cliques. Uh, and you know, this is this uh, last statement that I just said is kind of you know, shown by the fact that the edge conductance is order one over n. So in particular, if you take one clique, there are n squared edges inside, and order n coming out. So this gives you uh, the, this gives you conductance one over n. The vertex conductance, on the other hand, is order one. Uh, in particular, if we take um, if we take one clique, then there are n vertices in that clique, and there are also n vertices adjacent to that clique. So when we're, we aren't using the fact that there are a large number of internal edges, we only care about the number of vertices. So, so this you can actually show then that the vertex conductance is order one, and so our theorem says that there does exist a fast mixing Markov chain, um, that you know, ideally you'd have spectral gap Order, uh, order one, or relaxation time, order order one, but there could be this logarithmic factor, if you recall from our from our theorem. But actually, we can construct quite easily a chain that mixes in time order one. And how do we do this? We place a we place weight one, uh, a unit weight on all of the edges inside the cliques, and then place a weight n minus one on all of the edges that connect the two cliques. Okay, so now if we're at a vertex, there there's weight n minus one going to other elements of the same clique, and weight n minus one going to the other clique. So if you take a step inside the clique, you mix inside the clique, or you swap to the other clique. So basically, you just need to do each of these. You need to make sure you've got a good enough probability of swapping and a good enough probability of being randomized. But each of these has probability approximately a half of happening. So it takes time order one for this to happen, and thus the relaxation time is uh, is order one. Okay, the second example is similar, where we now have two cliques, but we consider one having a sort of source where k edges come out of it to connect to the other side. So I've shown here k being three. So the simple random walk on this graph, you can check has mixing time n squared over k. In particular, if you start in the right-hand clique, it's going to take you time n squared over k to 
exit, it'll take your time order n to hit the source node. And then uh, when you go here, there are k out of uh, there are k going out and n coming back in, so you have a uh, order n squared over k. Okay, and this is again you know emphasised by the fact that the edge conductance is k over n squared, but the vertex conductance um, is just one over n. If you take as your set the left hand clique, then you'll see that there are n vertices and one. On, on the boundary. So we have order 1 over n. And in particular, this is independent of, of k, because it didn't matter that there were k edges coming out, because they all went to the same node. So all that matters is uh, how many vertices there are. And so this is order 1 over n. And so we can create, uh, we can create a, a chain with mixing, with relaxation time that's you know, either that's somewhere between n and n squared log n. And in particular you can do this in, uh, you, you can get one with a relaxation time that's order n. How would you do this? You can use a sparsification tear, tear technique. So you take each of the cliques and just sparsify them to get a three regular expander graph. And also remove all of the connecting edges uh, between the source and the between the two cliques, except for one. And then you get two cliques which each have uh, which each are three regular expanders. And and then it's not particularly difficult to check that this has mix uh, this has relaxation time order n. Indeed, internally the relaxation time for each one is one, but it takes time order n to swap between the two cliques. So we can actually use this sparsification technique to go back to the first e e e example. And there's another way of constructing a, an order one relaxation time chain. So take the two cliques and just sparsify them to get three regular e expanders, uh, the same three regular, three regular expander on either side. And then uh, the graph now is just two copies of the same graph, just connected up where you know, corresponding pairs are, are connected. So it's actually quite easy to, to, to check in this case that if one of the graphs in this copy is, uh, is, is an expander, then so is, then so is the other one. So in particular, the whole graph is an expander and we get a relaxation time order one via sparsification. Okay, those are my two examples. I now want to talk a little bit about the proofs. So first we're going to talk about the characterization of fast mixing, which is a Chiga type inequality for the optimal relaxation time. So I mentioned very briefly earlier that Rock used duality to establish a variational characterization. And precisely that is this variational characterization. Now the precise details are, are a little bit technical, but the point to observe is that if you fix a function f and then optimize over g, so then the minimization, you know, the value is a function of f, then this yields a linear program for a fractional matching on a weighted graph where the weight is given by you know, this function of, of, of f. Okay, so now instead of before we were thinking about like edge conductance and vertex conductance, now we've got something in terms of a fractional matching. And so we introduce matching conductance. So precisely a matching is a set of edges with no common endpoint. And let's denote by M of S the value of the maximum weight matching on the, on the cut between S and S complement. Uh, and this weight is here in the previous, um, is, is just with weight one on each edge. Okay, and now I'll let, very similar to the, to the definition of edge and vertex conductance, let's let epsilon of, of s um, be this weight divided by uh, the smaller of the size of the set and the size of its complement. And then epsilon of g is just the minimum over all sets, sets that aren't the empty set or the full set. So they don't have zero in the denominator. Okay, so we call this the matching conductance, 
and you can actually check that this is of the same order as a vertex conductance uh, with a uniform constant over the graph. Um, so this is uniformly in the graph. Uh, but something that would be very important for our analysis is that actually for some sets the matching conductance can be way smaller than the vertex conductance. And so our analysis really doesn't work with vertex conductance, but it works with matching conductance. So this you know, introducing this new matching conductance is, conductance is really absolutely key for the uh, for the proof. And so our our main theorem is just you know, this is just a restatement of of the other one really is to prove this Chiga type inequality, but for matching conductance. Now, as as you see, these have got you know, up to constants in there, so you could replace matching conductance with uh, vertex conductance. But the point is, I'm trying to emphasize that you know, the proof really uses matching conductance. And then you say at the end, oh, look, matching conductance is the same as this you know, more well-known vertex conductance. So I just want to say a very few words of the, on the proof. The lower bound, you just do this via a, via a test function, which is you know, a fairly common way. Uh, but the upper bound is a bit more complicated. Uh, there are two main steps, and if you're familiar with how proofs of um, these sorts of things go, in particular Chiga-like constants, the steps perhaps won't be super surprising to you, but yeah, they're still, uh, just because the idea is there, it's still difficult to, to do. So first of all, we reduce it to a one-dimensional problem using johnson lindenstrauss lemma. Uh, and then we study matching conductance of these sweep steps uh, you know, defined as shown. So the first step is where this extra factor of log n on the right arises. Um, and I'll mention in, at the end a little bit about removing this factor. Well, we can't remove this factor, but uh, comment about how, it, how it, it would be nice to. Okay, so that's the, that is the matching conductance and the characterization. Now I just want to talk very briefly about, even more briefly, about the almost mixing construction. And for this we use a weighted spanning tree. So the idea is to choose some uh, arbitrary rooted breadth first, breadth first search tree and then suitably weight it. Uh, we then adjust the holding probabilities to make the invariant distribution close to uniform. Okay, the precise construction uh, we, we first denote by t of x or t subscript x the, sub, the subtree rooted at x. So T is a tree with a hierarchical structure, a, a root and then offspring and so on. So let's denote Tx the subtree if you were to just look at x and everything below. Now we let the weight of the edge from x to its parent be proportional to the size of this tree Tx, so the number of vertices beneath it, uh, including itself. But then we, but then we have to downweight this, um, and we downweight this by a factor that is uh, proportional to epsilon over the diameter of the tree. But the key for choosing a breadth first, fir a breadth first search tree, and actually the only reason for choosing this, is that the diameter of this BFS tree is the same order as the diameter of the graph. Um, it's obviously at least the diameter of the graph, but it's actually at most twice the twice the diameter, because you could just go via the root. So all you need is a tree that has diameter the same order as the diameter of the graph. We then augment this tree with uh, this weighted tree with unit weight self loops. Okay, and so this weighting helps the random walk to exit traps and bottlenecks and, uh, and the like. Why, for example, Suppose that a certain part of the graph contains a large number of vertices, but it's poorly connected, connected to the rest of the graph. For example, it might have just a single edge, E, connecting it to the rest of the graph, and assume that the rest of the graph contains, contains the root. This means that the, ed, the weight of the edge E is 
the number of vertices in S, which we've assumed is 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 large, and so the weights of the edges near E are are also large by the construction, uh, and so this kind of you know, encourages the walk to exit S via the edge E and and to do so fairly quickly. Okay, and then just a closing slide um, on on uh, open on open questions and problems. Uh, the first one is that we would like to remove the log n factor in the Chica type inequality, uh, but you can't remove everything. You need a log d max factor uh, unless the small set expansion hypothesis is uh, is false. Um, so we we explain a bit more in the paper exactly why 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 this is. But you do need some factor. It's not it's not true in general without any factor. So we'd also like to generalize the Chiga type inequality to non-uniform invariant distributions. Now, we had thought this might be fairly uh, this might be fairly easy, and it's and it is easy to get really trivial bounds that involve you know factors of pi min over pi max and stuff like that. But you know, we have we weren't able to prove it uh, the same sort of result for general for for general invariant dis distributions. And so this is you know, certainly an important open question. The almost mixing construction actually already the immediately extends. Basically, just instead of looking at the cardinality of a set, you look at the invariant measure of a of a set. Okay, could we obtain more explicit constructions of fast mixing chains? Uh, if you remember in the examples that I gave, we you know, we constructed them explicitly, and actually we often used in in both cases we could use sparsification techniques. So perhaps we can uh, perhaps you can do some sort of spectral sparsification or something like this to show to construct more explicitly a fast mixing chain. Uh, this was actually our first our our first method of uh, you know, our our first method, but we weren't able to do this as well as we'd like, and then we found this method with matching conductions. Uh, and lastly, are there any uh, algorithmic applications? All the all the previous work on fast and mixing Markov chain had been to do with lower bounds, or it it, it either been characterizing the problem as you know, convex and stuff like this, uh, or proving lower bounds because the dual result normally proves uh, lower bounds. So we were the, ours are the first you know, uh, sort of non-trivial results on on upper bounds, and could there be some algorithmic a a application or you know, even some more abstract a application where you say that there, there does exist some fast mixing Markov chain? Um, yeah, so if anyone has some of these, please, please, please do contact us and let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening.